Hi everybody. Welcome to Universe View Odyssey channel. Dialogue concerning EPR argument, paper summary. Q1. We're looking at the great debate in the history of physics, the Bohr-Einstein debate, and in the last video we studied the background to the EPR debate. Briefly explain the key points of the famous EPR paper. First of all, it would be better to start with the perspective of the authors, that is, Einstein and his colleagues, Albert Einstein, Boris Podolsky, Nathan Rosen, EPR. The EPR tried to argue that quantum mechanics theoretical predictions are exactly in line with experimental results, but quantum mechanics itself cannot be the ultimate theory of describing the micro world, that it is not completely wrong, but an incomplete theory. Q2. So what was the key target EPR aimed at being incomplete? Is it the same uncertainty principle as the previous debate 1 and 2? You got it right. EPR argued that every particle in a quantum system has a definite position and velocity, momentum, at any instant, and thus the uncertainty principle is not a limit inherent in nature, but a limit of quantum mechanics itself. If all particles have definite positions and velocities, then quantum mechanics that fails to find them properly is bound to be an incomplete theory that describes only a part of the universe. In other words, EPR tried to argue that quantum mechanics is an incomplete theory because it does not describe a definitely existing physical reality, and at best it is only a stepping stone to guide us to a complete theory. Q3. It seems that Einstein could not tolerate the uncertainty principle at all. In the previous two attacks, he were rather hit back, but I wonder how he argued this time. In fact, this paper is not easy even for physicists. It is an argument that adds philosophy to physics. Still, once you listen to it, I think it will help you understand later. You asked about the method of argument. EPR was trying to argue that the concepts of reality and locality, which have been fully accepted from ancient times to the present in physics and philosophy, are not compatible with quantum mechanical descriptions of physical reality. In other words, although quantum mechanics explains phenomena well, it does not completely describe reality. Q5. To sum up EPR's argument, the widely used concept of reality and locality is incompatible with quantum mechanics, so quantum mechanics is problematic. So first we have to talk about the concept of reality and locality. Realitat, reality, is a philosophical term, and it is a concept opposed to ideality which means that it exists objectively and independently of our consciousness. Locality means that there exists a specific space that is not affected by events occurring in one space, and is commonly used as the principle of locality. So, it means that two objects in two spaces that are not affected cannot directly affect each other. Einstein asserted that if this principle of locality was not true, no closed system could exist, and therefore the laws of physics could not be proved experimentally. Q6. It's a bit difficult, but I've gotten it so far. Shall we go one step further into the EPR argument? The EPR argument presents the completeness standard as a hypothesis premised on the aforementioned reality and locality. That is, if a particular physical theory is complete, it must have a counterpart to each element of physical reality. EPR uses this hypothesis to prove that quantum mechanics is an incomplete theory through syllogism. Major premise. If a physical theory is complete, and if position, x, and momentum, p, are physical realities, then the theory must have a complete description of these elements. Minor premise, there is no description of these physical entities. Conclusion, therefore, quantum mechanics is not a complete theory. Q7. The argument method is simple. The key would be specific cases to apply this. Do they use thought experiments here too? Yes. Einstein and his colleagues finally succeeded in developing a sophisticated logic that could accurately measure both the position and velocity of a particle. This is also a thought experiment, but the content is simple in principle. Q8. Shall we listen to EPR's thought experiment? Among the common physical phenomena, there is a case where one particle at rest decays into two particles. At this time, by the law of conservation of momentum, the two particles must fly in opposite directions, and the absolute value of their momentum is exactly the same. The two particles have exactly half the mass, and the magnitude of the speed is the same and the direction is opposite. If you measure and find out the position of one particle using these facts, 
you will be able to automatically know the position of other particles flying in the opposite direction, right? Therefore, the point of the EPR argument is that the momentum and position, which are complementary physical quantities of a particle, can be accurately grasped at the same time. Q9 R. By using the properties of twin particles, if you capture the position of one of the twin particles, you automatically know the position and speed of the other particle. Since we can accurately determine both position and velocity, momentum, we can disprove the uncertainty principle. So, what if we actually do a thought experiment? That's right. We could do an experiment. However, the problem is that it conflicts with the axiom of locality of the EPR argument, the premise of quantum mechanics, and the principle of measurement of the wave function. In other words, an axiom is a great premise that does not require proof. According to the locality principle, the observation of twin particle S1 does not affect the other twin particle S2. However, according to the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics, since the wave function of a particle spans the entire universe, the act of observing the position of twin particle S1 affects the momentum of particle S1 and also affects particle S2 at the same time. Now, how do we make the EPR argument testable? Q10. I think it's clear now what the gist of the EPR argument is. The twin particle thought experiment seems logically perfect, but I wonder how Bohr defended it. Before examining Bohr's refutation, let me first introduce you to the EPR argument adaptation by physicist David Bohm. Although EPR's argument is powerful and simple in principle, but technical difficulties were anticipated when applying this argument to experiments. One of them is that the momentum eigenfunctions, wave functions representing momentum, of the twin particles S1 and S2 contradict the locality axiom of EPR because, in principle, they spread throughout the universe. To solve this difficulty, Bohm adapted the EPR argument by introducing spin instead of position and momentum. Applying the EPR argument adaptation to twin particles, it is replaced by a thought experiment in which a particle with spin 0 decays into two particles S1 and S2 with spins minus 1 half and 1 half, flying in opposite directions. In the original version, the direction of the velocity was reversed according to the law of conservation of momentum, but according to the adaptation, the sign of the spin value is reversed according to the law of conservation of angular momentum. If the measured value of the z-direction spin component of the twin particle S1 is 1 half, the z-direction spin of S2 is minus 1 half, and so on. Bohm's adaptation is physically equivalent to the original, but much simpler. Einstein also reviewed the adaptation and rated it as very good, so the physics community conducted experiments with this adaptation. Q11. So, now introduce the counterattack of Bohr. Bohr published a rebuttal paper in the 48th issue of the physics journal Physical Review, where the EPR paper was published. Bohr first pointed out that it is unreasonable to apply the term, physical reality, which was put forward as a premise of EPR's argument, to quantum mechanics. In other words, he argued that it is wrong to assign reality to momentum and position because the standard of, physical reality, is ambiguous. In response to EPR's argument that, a theory that cannot describe physical reality is not a complete theory, Bohr refuted, then what is physical reality? Q12. It's already starting to feel like a philosophical debate rather than a physics debate. It's not unreasonable to feel that way. It is evaluated that the physics world has changed to a physics debate in the 1960s after only philosophical debates for nearly 30 years. Still, let's take a closer look at Bohr's argument. Bohr wrote in the paper, through experiments, we realize that quantum mechanical phenomena go beyond the problem that the value of certain physical quantities is unknown, and that it is impossible to clearly define these physical quantities. Bohr argued that it is not right for EPR to presuppose a physical reality, in which the applicability of the concept is unclear while discussing the perfection of quantum mechanics. Q13. Bohr attacked first the reality that EPR put forward as an axiom. Is locality the next target for Bohr? Yes. By attacking the reality and locality that EPR put forward as an axiom of argument, Bohr counterattacked that the premise of EPR itself could not be established. Bohr also questioned the axiom of locality, 
which states that EPR's measurement of particle S1 does not affect particle S2. Bohr presupposed that measurement of particle S1 is certain that it does not have a mechanical effect on S2. Then Bohr argued, however, there is no guarantee that measurements of S1 will not affect the future behavior of a physical system composed of two particles, S1 and S2. Bohr's argument is that it is unreasonable to presuppose locality in quantum mechanical phenomena. Q14. Now, to briefly summarize Bohr's refutation, it is unreasonable to apply the basic premise of the EPR argument, or the axiom of reality and locality, to quantum mechanics. Since the premise itself cannot be established in the first place, the EPR argument, that is, the claim of incompleteness of quantum theory, has no choice but to be rejected. Well done. Bohr's rebuttal logic is in fact different from emphasizing the Copenhagen interpretation, organized by his own initiative. Regarding reality, one of the EPR axioms, the traditional concept of reality itself cannot be applied in the context of quantum mechanics. It corresponds to the clause of the Copenhagen interpretation that states that the quantum system is affected by the observer. In other words, it is an argument that the very understanding of the classical concept of reality, that things exist independently of our consciousness, must be changed. In the case of locality, it contradicts the provision of the Copenhagen interpretation that the state of a quantum system is described by a wave function and has stochastic properties. It is assumed that the wave function has a probability to be spread throughout the universe by the principle of superposition, and an instantaneous response is transmitted by measurement. This is in direct contradiction to the axiom of locality of EPR. Q15. What happens if we apply Bohr's objection to the EPR thought experiment? Bohr's argument is as follows. EPR's locality premise is wrong. The wave functions of S1 and S2 exist throughout the universe, so the act of measuring S1 affects the measurement of S2. This is because the premise that the value of the physical quantity of S2 is known through the measurement of S1 is wrong, so the argument of EPR cannot be accepted. Q16. Listening to Bohr's refutation, that also makes sense. But how can we conclude who is right? This debate, which had been a philosophical debate, was turned into a discriminable physics problem by British physicist John Bell in 1964, 29 years later. 18 years later, French experimental physicist Alan Aspect successfully conducted an experiment using Bell's methodology, and judged the authenticity of the EPR argument. The process and results will be introduced in the next video. Thanks for watching. You can read this story in Injury Time, injurytime.kr.